your Bibles, uh, we're going to cover a lot of things, in fact, but we're going to focus on Acts chapter 13. What I want to do this morning, a couple of things. One, I want to encourage us, kind of a spot check, you might say, to keep reading in our Bibles. I appreciate the, the comments, the feedback uh, about the sermons that were taken from the reading, and this one even more so today. But if you're doing your daily Bible reading, then, then you know you're up through week 18, week 18. And so the year just seems like it's just flying by. If you haven't been doing your reading, why not today? Pick up a schedule back there if you need one. I can always print more. I, I just encourage that so much. So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. So let's stay in our Bibles. There was something that I did back in 2020. Uh, that was, of course, when COVID was such an even bigger problem, of course. We, we were just learning about COVID. But I really started it before COVID started and continued it through that time. And that was a series called Seeing 2020 Through the Scriptures. Now, you know, our vision 2020 is our best vision that I know of anyway. And it was the year 2020, so I thought that just fits together pretty well. And so we went, we went with that. And, and so what I did is each week I just reviewed all of the, that week's scripture reading and then focused on one particular part. And I want to share one of those with you this morning. And I'll, I'll be interested in hearing your feedback if you'd like to, to, to do more of these in that way. But I really want to encourage us to read. This schedule is just one of many. You may have a Bible uh, app that has its own schedule in it. It's just a way of systematically reading all the way through the Bible. It really doesn't take that long. And when we look to see what we read week 18, which we'll do here in just a minute, it, it's really surprising how much you get done in a week. But it only takes a few minutes every day. And, and so I encourage you to do that. For me, it works out well first thing in the morning. That's the first thing I do. Well, that's the second thing I do. I make coffee first, and then, and then I cook my Bible reading. Um, and, and it's a great way to start the day, I think. I, I, it's hard to think of a better way. And so as we uh, look at then week 18, um, there's a lot that we're going to see. I don't know if you can see uh, this picture is not showing up as well. I'm not sure why. But this is a Bible a dusty Bible, and you can barely make out on the top of it, written with somebody's finger, read me. Yeah. It's kind of like you ever seen a really dirty car, and somebody writes on the back of the windshield, wash me. Yeah. Um, that's kind of like this picture. It's supposed, it's supposed to be. Um, as we think about what we've read, if, you're, if you read this week, here's what you did. You have read 1 Samuel 18 through 25, 1 Chronicles 3 through 7, Psalm 59, 56, 57, 142, 52, 54. You've read Acts chapter 13 through chapter 17. That's how many chapters are in the New Testament. Worked out pretty well. Uh, so our daily Bible reading is one chapter per day, Monday through Friday, for 52 weeks, and you've read the entire New Testament. But I want us to, to focus now. I, I want to... Well, let me, let me briefly say these chapters first. I'm getting a little ahead of myself. Uh, Acts chapter 13. We're reading through Acts chapter 13. Barnabas and Saul are appointed. They're getting ready to go on the first missionary journey. The exciting time. They're leaving out of Antioch. And so they, they preach in Cyprus and then at Antioch and Pisidia. There are two different Antiochs. And then they're blessing and conflicts there in Antioch. And then in chapter 14, the first missionary journey continues. They go to Iconium. There's idolatry abundant at Lystra. They're stoned. But they, uh, Paul is, but they escape to Derby, And they're strengthening the converts. And then in Acts 15, they're back home now. They've completed the first missionary journey, and they're back home. But there's a problem. 
there are some people coming and, and, uh, and trying to get the Gentile converts to, to believe that they've got to be circumcised in order to be saved. And Paul is like, no, that is not, that is not the case. And so they're going to go to Jerusalem in Acts 15 to, to try to work this out and settle this dispute. And so there's the Jerusalem council. And um, the, and that council, they let them know, no, we never told anybody to go teach you that. You do not have to keep the law of Moses to be saved. So they have a big discussion about that. And they continue their ministry in Syria. But then there's a division over John Mark. And say, well, why was there a division over John? Because on the first missionary journey, they go through the island of Cyprus to begin their journey. They leave the island. They go up to the mainland. And for some reason, John Mark just leaves them. He goes back to Jerusalem. We're never told why he does that. Don't know. But it was not a good thing. Oh, Paul didn't think it was. Because now Paul says, let's go back. Let's retrace our steps on our first missionary journey. Let's see how the brethren are doing. And, and, and Barnabas is like, let's take John Mark. And Paul says, no. He left us, remember. Let's not take him. So they have some conflict over that. They worked it out, and they end up both making their own missionary journeys. And then we get to Acts chapter 16. Now we find the second missionary journey has started. It actually started in chapter 15 and verse 40, but, but they're on the second journey. And on the second journey, there's this young disciple named Timothy that they, they meet, and he starts traveling with them. Well, you wonder, you know, where does Timothy come from? First and second Timothy in our Bibles. Well, here in Acts chapter 16, it'll talk about this young man that they all spoke so highly of. And he starts traveling with Paul and with Silas. They wanted to go and preach in Asia, but the Holy Spirit said no. But then Paul had a dream about somebody from Macedonia saying, come over and help us. And we talk about the Macedonian call, don't we? Remember our song, I have heard the Macedonian call today. We just sing it, send the light, send the light. And, and so that's where the, the basis of that song comes from, Acts, Acts chapter 16. Remember the story of Lydia. As, you know, she was out there by the river. She and a group of women worshiping. She ends up being baptized uh, there at Philippi. Paul and Silas are put in prison at Philippi, and we have the story of the Philippian jailer and how he was converted and, and uh, became a Christian, he and his household, and they have shamefully treated Paul and Silas. They have beaten them. They have thrown them in prison, and now they send word to just, y'all just go on. Y'all just leave town. And Paul is like, no. You have beaten us openly, uncondemned, and I am a Roman citizen. Paul didn't mind exerting his rights as a Roman citizen that they had violated, and it scared them to death. And they work it out, and Paul is, and Silas are going to leave. But not before Paul has his say uh, of what he thought about the way they were treated. And then in Acts chapter 17, uh, Paul is, uh, is preaching Christ at Thessalonica, they have trouble there. Jason's house is attacked. Then they go to Berea. Remember that those in Berea were more noble-minded noble than those in Thessalonica? Uh, there in, in the 17th chapter. Then Paul goes to Mars Hill, and he's talking to, the, to some people who knew nothing about God or Jesus there in, in Acts chapter 17. But what I want to do now is I want to focus. I want to go to Acts chapter 13. And I want us to, to look at a passage here that I read part of uh, at the Lord's table there. Let's look at it a little more closely. And so we're kind of spotlighting this passage. And again, I've read some already. But I think there are some great lessons to learn here. One is on, a, on the level of when we're preaching and teaching. In my case, preaching, and some of you um, uh, maybe the time to fill in, you know, and you certainly many of you teach, right? And so if you think about doing that, 
what we see here is a good example that you start where people are. You, you don't want to you don't want to preach over somebody's head. That does no good. But you don't need to tell them to do things they've already done either. You start where they are. And so if a person's already a believer, for instance, you don't say, hey, you need to believe. Well, I, I already believe. But Paul is recognizing who his audience is. His audience are mainly Jews and, and Gentile proselytes. And so he's going to start from where they are knowing the scriptures like they should know them. And I think that's a good reminder to us. If you're studying with somebody, see where they are. Where's, what's their relationship with God? Do they believe in God? Do they know anything about the Bible? Do they believe in the Bible itself? Find out, that, you know, find out where they are and then go from there. And that's what Paul is going to do. And so starting in Acts chapter 13, as I mentioned earlier, Paul is, he went to the synagogue. Now when he goes to the synagogue, who's he going to find mostly? It will be Jews and um, Gentiles converted or proselytes. And so he's there and he's, he is starting with things they all agree on. Let's, let's get on the same page here. You know, we, we, uh, they, they have the Old Testament, right? He, and in fact, as we get started in the passage, in verse 15, and after the reading of the law and the prophets, the rulers of the synagogue sent to them, saying, men and brethren, if you have any word of exhortation for the people, say on. And so they opened the door. What a door of opportunity for, for Paul and, and Silas there. And if you have anything to say, you know, you, you visitors here, just, just say it. But what had they just been doing? They had finished the reading of the law and the prophets. And we'll come back to that here in just a minute. And so in verse 16, Paul stood up and motioning with his hand said, Men of Israel, and you who fear God, listen. And then he gives them a brief history lesson that they already knew this. But what was he doing? He's, he's establishing common ground. He's like, listen, we both believe these things. That, that the God of this people, Israel, chose our fathers and exalted the people when they dwelt as strangers in the land of Egypt. And with an uplifted arm, he brought them out of it. And he talked about the wandering in the wilderness for 40 years. And just, just that history lesson, you might say. Verse 20 is interesting in this. It says, and after that, he gave them judges for about 450 years until Samuel the prophet. Now, we've just been talking about that, haven't we, about the judges. Well, here it says about 450 years. Really, the time of the judges lasted about 400 years. But what he includes here is the wandering in the wilderness, 40 years, 10 years to conquer the land, and then 400 years of the judges, which would add up to 450. And so he, he talks about those. And afterward, they ask for a king, verse 21. We've just been studying that, right? And so they're all on the same page. And then in verse 22, he removed him. He raised up for them David as king. Now going from David, he's going to bring David and connect David to Jesus. That's, that's his connection now. They, they, they are like, amen, all the way through. That's right, amen. Wandered in the woods. Yep, Saul was the king. David was the king. They're all, they're all right there together. Then he says in verse 23, he said, from this man's seat, from this man's seat, according to the promise, he's appealing to their faith in the Old Testament that this is what God promised. God raised up for Israel a Savior, Jesus. And he doesn't want them to be surprised by this. God promised this, and he's going to share those scriptures with them. Uh, there, and, and verse 23 is on the screen. Verse 24 and 25, he briefly mentions John the Baptist, who was the forerunner. And then in verse 26, men and brethren, sons of the family of Abraham, and of those among you who fear God. You see that 
that connection he's, he's trying to hold on to with them. He says, to you, the word of this salvation has been sent. Of what? We'll go back up to verse 23. God raised up for Israel a Savior, Jesus. And he says, God's doing this for you. He sent this, Jesus, for you. To you, the word of this salvation has been fulfilled. For those who dwell in Jerusalem and their rulers, because they did not know him, nor even the voices of the prophets, which are read every Sabbath, have fulfilled them and condemning him. Remember we said in verse 15, what had they just been doing? And the Son of God, reading from the law of the prophets. And Paul says, that scripture you've been reading all this time. He said, the rulers over there in Jerusalem, they're, they're over uh, in um, Antioch of Pisidia. But back there in Jerusalem, they've been reading the law, just like you have. They didn't understand it. And um, they're in verse 26. Uh, I'm sorry, verse 27. Nor even the voices of the prophets, which are read every Sabbath. He said, they fulfill them in condemning Jesus. They're actually fulfilling the law. And, they, and though they found no cause for death in him, they asked Pilate that he should be put to death. And so then it goes into the story of Jesus, the death, the burial, and the resurrection. But notice he's appealing to the Scripture. According to the promise, God raised up a Savior, Jesus. And to you the word of this salvation has been sent. That's Jesus. Then in verse 27, he said, because they did not know him. Now, there's a lot of people that say a lot of things about Jesus today because they don't know it. And so we need to get to know him, and we do that through studying his word. And he said, and, and they didn't know the voices of the prophets. Now, brethren, sometimes we don't know the voices of the prophets like we need to. They're there. They're there for our learning. Romans 15 and verse 4. But he said the very thing they did against Jesus was actually fulfilling the prophets. Continuing in the 13th chapter, it says in verse 29, Now when they had fulfilled all that was written concerning him, they took him down from the tree, they laid him in a tomb. Imagine he's talking to these people who maybe knew a little but not a lot about Jesus, but they were supposed to know the old law. And he says, you know what they've done? They fulfill scripture. But well, see, these people believe scripture. And when we appeal to people based on what they believe, can't we get further? If we establish that they believe the Bible, you're studying with somebody, maybe talking with a neighbor, a co-worker, and they believe the Bible, well, you know, you point to, you know, the Bible says. You know? Well, if they believe the Bible and you show the Bible says, that should make a difference, shouldn't it? And, and with Paul, he said, you believe the law and the prophets, and the law and the prophets said, and look, Jesus fulfilled all of that. It should make a difference. But, verse 30, they laid him in a tomb, but God raised him from the dead. Now, why would they believe that? Now, the scriptures that they do believe said, as he'll point out to them, he would not be allowed to suffer decay. He would not stay in the tomb. God raised him from the dead. Why believe Paul? He was seen for many days by those who came up from Galilee to Jerusalem who are his witnesses to the people. Don't just take our word for him. He was seen. Remember 1 Corinthians 15, the first several verses, witness after witness of the resurrection is listed. In fact, at one point, over 500 brethren at one time saw Jesus alive. And Paul says, we're, we're the witnesses about this. In verse 32, and we declare this to you. So Paul said, here's, here's what I'm telling you about. You believe the scriptures. They're read every Sabbath day in the Son of God. I'm telling you about Jesus who fulfilled the scriptures that you believe in. But they didn't understand that. They killed him. They put him in the tomb. 
but God raised him from the dead, and there is eyewitness testimony. Don't take my word for it. We declare to you glad tidings, that promise which was made to the fathers. Now, he's talking about two different promises here, I believe. One promise was made to David, King David, that he'd have an heir on the throne. Jesus fulfilled that. Another promise was made to the fathers. Generally, that talks about back to the patriarchs, like Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. And God promised Abraham, through his seed, all the nations of the earth would be blessed. That's glad tidings when that comes about. Glad tidings is another way of saying gospel, good news. That promise which was made to the fathers. God has fulfilled this for us, their children, in that he has raised up Jesus, as it is also written in the second psalm. You see him going back to Scripture again? Isn't that what we need to do when we're talking and studying with somebody? And for our own faith, go back to the Scripture. As it is also written in the second psalm, you are my son today. I have begotten you. And then in verse 38, he says, therefore. He's going to draw a conclusion now from all that, that he has just said. Let me catch up with, with, my, with myself here. Because we left off with uh, today I have begotten you in verse 33. He raised him from the dead, verse 34. In verse 35, he, he puts another scripture to, to them. You shall not allow your Holy One to see corruption. And verse 36 talks about David died, buried, decayed, like people do. And then he says in verse 39, or verse 38, Therefore, let it be known to you, brethren, that through this, that through this man is preached to you the forgiveness of sins. Now, Jews... You know what a problem sin is. How many thousands of sacrifices have been offered over and over and over to forgive sins? You know what this man has done? I want to talk to you about forgiveness of sin. And by him, everyone who believes and is justified from all the things which you could not be justified by the law of Moses. The, the law of Moses never abolish sin. You had to keep offering sacrifices over and over, but not Jesus. Jesus has fulfilled the prophets. Do you see the appeal of this uh, to the people that he's talking to? Let me tell you about Jesus. Let me tell you that your sins can be forgiven. You've got to come to know who he is. God foretold this centuries ago, and now it has happened that you can be forgiven. That, that is the message of salvation, to be forgiven of your sins. Now, when he says in verse 39, and by him everyone who believes is justified from all things. When the Bible talks about belief, as it does here, it's not talking about you just accept, okay, Jesus is the Son of God, and that's as far as it goes with you. That, that's not a saving faith. The demons believe and tremble, but that didn't save them. There were rulers in the synagogue who believed who Jesus was, but they wouldn't confess it. That belief didn't save them. The belief that saves you is the belief that changes you, the belief that leads you to repent which means a change of heart, the belief that leads you to be baptized. And there are so many examples of that uh, still in the, in the book of Acts. Uh, but Acts, look back at chapter 11, in Acts chapter 11. Remember how that uh, Peter was sent to the house of Cornelius? And he's preaching to them. And the Holy Spirit falls on them. And some people think, oh, they're saved. No, they're still not saved yet. The Holy Spirit fell on them to show that they were worthy of the gospel as a Gentile. And then, um, find the verse, on, uh, verse 43, to him all the prophets witness through his name, whoever believes in him will receive remission of sins. Then they taught them about Jesus. And then in verse 48, he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. 
Well, then they were called to task about that. The Jewish brethren thought you went to Gentiles and, and you went and you ate with them, you spent the night with them, you went into their house, all of that, and then you preached the gospel. And they said, no, let me tell you about it. And when he tells them about it, if you go over to chapter 11 and verse 17, he said, if therefore God gave them the same gift as he gave us when we believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I that I could withstand God? When they heard these things, they became silent, and they glorified God, saying, Then God has also granted to the Gentiles repentance to life. We've got belief, we've got repentance, and we've got baptism. And it always happens like that with every example of conversion. The same thing happens, and, and we've run out of time. The same thing happened in, in Acts chapter 16 when uh, the jailer wanted to know what to do to be saved. And he was told in verse 31, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you will be saved. Well, then they taught him, just like with Cornelius. You've got to believe in Jesus. Now, let me tell you about it. And so the uh, jailer, you've got to believe in Jesus. Now, let me tell you about him so you can believe in him. And then um, in verse 33, Immediately he and all his household were baptized. It's the same pattern we see over and over. And so here in Acts 13, I'd like to, to uh, bring all of this to a conclusion then. Back in Acts 13, now he's just talked to them. He's just told them, Jesus, that the Jews crucified. He's the Savior. He's the one promised all through Scripture. Now what are you going to do about it? What are you going to do? They've heard God's word. And you know, we've got the same two choices that they had. They, they were, Paul gives them these two choices. But you notice in your Bibles, notice in verse 43. Now, when the congregation had broken up, many of the Jews and devout proselytes followed Paul and Barnabas, who, speaking to them, persuaded them to continue in the grace of God. What's does it mean continuing the grace of God? Titus chapter 2 and verse 11 says, For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. God's grace is, is the giving of Jesus. It's allowing you to hear and respond to the gospel. That's God being gracious to you. And he says, you've heard the gospel. You've heard the message of salvation. Continue in this grace. In other words, believe in it. Be obedient to it. So that's what he's urging them to do in verse 43. Or you can do what we read in verse 45. The Jews saw the multitudes. They were filled with envy. So they're getting people to, to push back against the apostles. And verse 46, Then Paul and Barnabas grew bold and said, It was necessary that the word of God should be spoken to you first. But since you reject it, and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life. Behold, we turn to the Gentiles. What, what had those done who rejected God's grace? The gospel of Jesus. They decided they weren't worthy of everlasting life. Isn't that a sad thing to decide? If you won't accept God's way for you to have everlasting life, you have judged yourself to be unworthy. We're going to sing a song now that it's meant to encourage all of us to be ready to meet the Lord. If you know about Jesus, but you just push him away, you have judged yourself unworthy of everlasting life. And none of us want that. Or if you have become a Christian and you've wandered away from the Lord, is it the same thing true? You have judged yourself unworthy of everlasting life? Don't be that person. Be sure to come to the Lord. And if we can help you in that in, in any way, let it be known while together we stand to sing. Lord, uh...